two, I would say, in my understanding of global law and the way that I'm thinking about global law, uh, it's it's on the one hand when we come to the uh, the divergent species, they are largely about the decentering of the state, but certainly not all of the convergent species are about the decentering of the state. Uh, the uh, I've already forgotten but the wonderful phrase that Maria used that she she took from Foucault about being about the states being the, the masters of was it the masters of, of official of officiality? Oh, yeah, okay. In many ways, the states are still the masters of officiality, or at the very least, they are the brokers of officiality. And that's one of the points I would want to make about the, the conversion species. Because I start off with fairly basic stuff within international law. The structural approach, the, the development of the UN as a peak organization with coercive authority, also the formal approach within international law, the use of use cogens, obligation ergonomies, Setting the rules of interpretation, etc. And what I'm saying is that that very, very orthodox set of moves within international law, which would all be claimed by international lawyers as being part of the orthodox framework of international law, is itself something which involves an intimation of global law. Okay? You know, we only need to think about the way in which uh, uh, the powers of the UN have extended, we only need to think about their Chapter 7 powers. Uh, in war making, we'll need to think about ideas such as humanitarian intervention. We only need to think in the formal area about the way in which notions of use cogens uh, have developed. And today, as well as covering obvious things like slavery and torture, you know, tentatively cover things like apartheid, self determination, etc., etc. What we have is a constant pushing back of these boundaries. And remember, in these areas of international law, the brokers of officiality are still very much the states. Uh, push it, constant pushing back of these boundaries uh, uh, in favor of, uh, of notions which actually go beyond an idea that international law is just a law between consenting states. And when international law just becomes an unconstrained global law which affects all people, including those who haven't necessarily uh, subscribed to the rules in question. Alongside that, we have a massive area of what I call abstract normative uh, uh, law. And of course, this, 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 this can be distinguished between abstract normative law, which has a positive quality, and human rights law would be the most fundamental example there. You know, no one can talk about human rights law today and only deal with particular regimes of human rights law. If I ask you to write a book, a, a thesis about human rights law, and you talk about the ECHR, you talk about the inter-American system, you talk about other regional systems, I would still say, yeah, but what about the rest of human rights law? Because there's a sense in which human rights law is seen as a global vernacular which stands beyond and above these particular positive areas of law. These claims are made generally across the board. They're often made by lawyers, they're often made by political theorists, they're often made by government actors, etc., etc. But there is a sense in which human rights is seen as something which again has this kind of global categorization. But beyond that, and there's a large section in the book where I delve into a lot of uh, uh, jurisprudential theory on what I would call abstract normative systems, people who talk about the global rule of law, uh, uh, people like Klaus Günther who talk about the universal code of legality which underpins, as a Habermasian, this idea that this is a communicative structure which underpins all legal orders. Uh, 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 other people who talk specifically, uh, Rafael Dominguez about the new global law, who talks about the new universalism, new forms of global solidarity, etc. The sorts of claims that are being made there are abstract normative claims which aren't necessarily claims within positive law, but are claims which attempt to frame positive law. That brings me to the historical discursive approach, uh, where in particular what we're talking about here is, is uh, so the abstract normative would either be the umbrella, if it's the positive stuff in, in top, or the vessel, if you take something like the rule of law, a uniform code of legality, or somehow sitting underneath the rest of law. Historical discursive approach are ones which uh, go back into history, in particular, uh, there's lots of examples, Jewish community, Lex Mercatoria, but the best example here is probably global constitutional law, 
So you take the tradition of constitutional law and certain ideas of equality and economy and try to reframe that in terms of a global constitutional discourse. And often that happens between different national authorities. And that's an example of one which isn't necessarily transnational, but it happens that, that, that there's a normative movement across different uh, uh, national orders. <coughs> Oops. Right. <laughs> again? It seems to have gone again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Despite the fact that. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, right. I suspect it has to do with how quickly I turn these things on and off. Uh, okay. I will only be another. Ten minutes or so. Okay, probably. Um, let me move to the what I call the divergent species. And these are the these these are the these are the types of global law which are defined not by uh, the attempt to provide some sort of uh, new form of hierarchy or some sort of general norms which somehow cover or encompass the whole, but instead they're ones which are specifically about the management of diversity. And often when people talk about global law uh, within the transnational law literature, it's these forms which they are actually more interested in. Uh, <clears throat> so where I have, we have on one hand what I call the laterally coordinate ones, which are chains, where the idea is that the globality is actually just about providing these thin chains, these thin pieces of tissue which connect different areas of global legality. So you take for granted the plurality of it, and then you develop thin connections between these. So there's a traditional literature of this within private international law, within the conflict of laws. There's a new, very interesting literature, a new type, a new way of thinking about uh, the conflict of laws, which it increasingly moves away from uh, uh, earlier orthodoxies, which saw private international law as very, very much being a series of discrete domestic ways of managing the interaction between one legal system and another. There's a much older tradition of private international law which saw private international law as being a kind of global conflict of laws with global principles. And in many ways, that thinking is coming back both in practice and in theory. There's also a new legal pluralism which is related to that, which is looking at people like Nico Krish who are looking for interface norms between different sorts of legal orders. There's what's called constitutional pluralism, a school with which I've also been associated myself, which is looking at the ways in which you might find different ways of accommodation between different constitutional quotes which are unavoidably in clashes with each other, as in the, as in the relationship between national courts and the European Court of Justice. And what you've got there, you might think, well, what's global about that? What's global about this, again, is an attempt to try to find general principles which will somehow dictate the relationship between all legal orders in situations of pluralism. There's also functionally specific regimes, a massive uh, interest in the idea of global public goods, uh, one which actually lawyers have only been catching up to recently because it's an interest which was driven more by political scientists and in particular economists. But the idea of there being specific regimes, it is like climate, uh, climate change, nuclear proliferation, etc. And here, the model here is segmentary. The idea that you don't have a holistic global public good, you just have it in a particular segment of activity, like the segment of an orange or a piece of fruit. Then you have what I call the new hybrids. Uh, and I draw a number of examples in the book here from, uh, from different authors. Uh, there's some wonderful work by Emmanuel Jouvenet, a French scholar, who talks about the new law of recognition, which he says, we had the old law of recognition in international law, which was just about the recognition of states. Alongside that, blended in with that now, we have a new law of recognition, which is still about the law of recognition of states, but it's also recognition of minorities, the recognition of uh, ethnic groups, the recognition of certain cultural groups, etc., etc. And we should think of that as a, an old law flowing into a new type of global law, which brings these things together. We also have Ruti Titel's idea of humanity law, 
where she tries to put together international human rights law and international criminal justice law together in a new type of humanitarian law. Or Christine Bell's idea of the law of peace, Lex Pacificatoria, as she calls it, things always look nicer in Latin. Uh, the idea that somehow if we take together certain norms of international law and certain norms of constitutional law, we have a new law of political settlements. And again, it's a flow. And again, the idea is that this law is a general law for the whole of the world. It's not just about particular jurisdictions. It's more general than that. And then again, we also have the historical discursive, but now on the other side of it, uh, the more fragmented readings. And global administrative law would be a good example here. You know, in many ways, you know, if you ever wanted to look at a paradigm case of the new global law in my terms, it would be global administrative law. Because it's something which in many ways has been developed by academics. It started off as a conference at NYU a number of years ago. I remember being invited to my conference and saying, nah, it doesn't look very interesting, you won't go to that. And 15 years later, it becomes the most uh, talked about project in global legalization for, for uh, probably of this century. So I got that one wrong. Uh, but global administrative law, so the idea there was, you know, that, that you, you see these different trends and a lot of what people have been talking about today would actually fall within the compass of global administrative law because it's precisely about the development by private actors or hybrid private public actors in areas like sport or uh, internet regulation, etc., etc. Things which escape the orthodox pedigree of international law or constitutional law, but nevertheless provide forms of normativity which look apt for regulation in accordance with administrative law rules. And out of that, you get this whole idea of a global administrative law as something which is about learning between different regimes and which gradually develops its own, uh, uh, its own global uh, uh, range. Okay, uh, right. So, salient features of global law. So, diverse response to sheer range of legal forms and regimes in the age of decentralized state law, including transnational law. There are all ways of providing a global legal reorientation. Their function is one of steering and shaping, but also of recontainment of this disorderly diversity. So, uh, uh, Larry was talking about earlier about you know, the relationship between order and disorder here. There is a sense in which these are all attempting to provide new forms of ordering, new forms of framing. Uh, <clears throat> rhetorically powerful, yet understated. I say noisy yet surreptitious. My point is that many of these new forms of global law <coughs> shout themselves from the rooftops, whether it be global administrative law or global human rights law. Many other sorts of areas, many of the other developments, however, that we see uh, within global law, and this has to do with the notion that global law has to have some sort of traction in reality. They, they come from very, very particular <coughs> developments whether it be in areas like corporate social responsibility or the development of indicators in this area or that area, whatever, often what happens is that there's a lot of trends on the ground. These come first and the attempt to reframe these incipient trends and develop these incipient trends comes afterwards. Global administrative law in some ways is an example of both sides of that story. Internally complex and unsettled, partly complementary, partly conflicting forms. So the point I'm trying to make here is that these seven or eight different forms of global law, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. They can sometimes be put together. It's perfectly possible you know, to believe in certain general abstract normative ideas, but also to believe in specific global regimes in particular areas. It's also possible that there will be conflicts between these. Of course it is, but the point is that the specification of these, just because they are seen as partial perspectives, means that they're not necessarily given that none of them are necessarily holistic perspectives in the way that state sovereignty was, they're not necessarily going to be at odds with each other. There will be conflicts, but the conflicts don't necessarily follow from the nature of the categories. What law is an operative practice is changes. It indicates a new mood, one of contestable becoming rather than incorrigible achievement. Many sources of the new global law craft, including new category of participant observer, jurist framers. This is my idea again, that this is something which is it ha happens in the becoming. It is something which has, uh, which somehow operates the space. I thought about this for a long time, and I thought, why is it that I can't 
work out whether a global law is actually law, or it's something prior to law. And I thought, because the very idea of global law is somehow creating a new type of continuum. It's not necessarily new. If we go back to the, the glossators of Roman law and the kind of work that they did, then you already see that move towards a kind of framing of law within law, which isn't quite yet law itself. So it's always been there. It's always been there at the margins of legal innovation. But it's something which becomes far more, uh, far more evident, far more intense, far more widely uh, articulated within the modern age. <coughs> uh, <coughs> given the contestation over deep principles of authority, there's also, I think, here, at the edges at least, a more explicit concern with matters of global justice. It's gradually been built into the reflexive development of global law. I think there is, or at least the prospect of a new normative term in the way that we think about this. I don't want to make too much of this, but I do think that, uh, that when, when you have this kind of reframing going on, then that reframing is something which itself becomes more, or can become more explicit about its, its, uh, its normative commitments. Whereas if you're, if you're operating within existing frames, then often the normative commitments associated with these existing frames are simply taken for granted. Right, let me just finish with a couple of points because uh, uh, I, I want to say <laughs> just again, just a little bit more on the dynamics of global law. There's at least four, it's always nice to do a dialectic. So these four dialectics here, there's a dialectic of unity and plurality, a global horizon for all of these different attitudes uh, and these different frames, but a plurality of perspectives upon that global horizon. <coughs> There's also a dialectic of generality and particularity within the global horizon, either accommodating the particular with a modest general norm, as in the divergence accommodating, or supplementing the particular with a more robust <coughs> general norm, as in convergence promoting. There's also a dialectic of ratio and voluntas, of reason and will, within the global horizon, either locating some new or rediscovered aspect of universal reason within law, or some new specific source of social or political foundational will. And there's also a dialectic of order and disorder, new forms of ordering of disorder, right? And of course, the irony of that is that that, that can, of course, lead to more disorder. The very attempt to frame, the very partial attempt to frame can actually increase uh, the, the disorderliness of the, of, of, of the scene. Possibilities of global law. Let me, now, this is, I want to finish with two points. One is about global law and the second is about global lawyers, right? So the, uh, the first has to do with, uh, and this is something I spent a long time thinking about, what does this mean for law? Not, not in the sense that Maria was talking about in her paper, where she was actually talking about the very feasibility of law and the very structure of law, etc., etc. What I'm trying to do is to say that if you have all these different frameworks of law, is there anything within them which suggests new forms of commonality, new themes within law? So that if you're talking about trends generally within global law, we can, we can point to certain things. Well, the only ones I could come up with, the only ones I could think of uh, going through this was, first of all, a kind of new commitment to what we call non-metaphysical universalism. That many, many of the approaches we're talking about, particularly in the convergence promoting side, are about new forms of universalism. They're not metaphysical, they're not based upon innate notions of the good, they're not based upon religion, but they're based upon claims which are made, uh, secular claims which are made about the nature of humanity, or in the context of human rights or global constitutionalism, etc., etc. Uh, but universalism here then is treated as a kind of collective and provisional accomplishment, something which can be argued again, argued within. Think about the human rights debates over the last 20 years and the way in which uh, uh, the Global South responded to the hegemony of a certain type of Western notion of human rights. Partly by saying we reject it, but partly also by saying we have another argument about human rights here. Based, so what you get is a kind of discourse of non-metaphysical universalism within the law, where people accept universalism, but have different notions of its content, but do so in a context with at least some scope for mutual engagement. Second point I'd make has to do with laws internal second order pluralism. So the point here is that you know part of the the genius of law has always been that it has this kind of second order morality, 
It's a way of resolving first order conflicts without necessarily making substantive choices with regards to these first order conflicts. That's how a lot of law works, it's how constitutional law works, it's how administrative law works, it's how a lot of private law works, etc. etc. And my point is that when we look at the relationship between different legal orders, say within the context of a lot of the divergence accommodating literature and legal pluralism, etc., what you see there often is a, an emphasis upon how law has to find a second best solution, a via media between different sorts of legal orders. And my point is that actually these sorts of things aren't necessarily different in kind from the sorts of things that law has always been doing in terms of looking for this second order type of, of, of normativity. The last point I would make and uh, has to do with the, 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 the continuity of, of legal process values. And here uh, I see uh, some uh, identity or some overlap with some work of Benoit's, which I was reading at the weekend, talking about the way in which global legal innovation usually comes at a context, in a context where you know, a problem is identified, an issue is identified. And what happens here is that often, and you see it in global administrative law, but also in other areas, that uh, 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 the, the law of lawmaking, in Harvey Massey's phrase, becomes very, very important here. That what you get is, at the beginning of this new process, is the identification of a new set of issues and the attempt to provide some legal frame around them. And very, very early in that process, there's all sorts of reflexive action activity going on about the need for a law of lawmaking, about how these rules should actually be generated, what the constitution of these rules should be. Gunter Teutner's work on societal constitutionalism is very much within that area. But so is a lot of the work of global administrative law. The fact that very, very quickly in this jurisdictional generative process, there has to be resort to thinking about the law of lawmaking. Larry made the point in his talk that we have to think differently about democracy within these transnational contexts. That is true. But what often you find within these sorts of areas, people use all sorts of different language, voice, accountability, etc., etc. They are drawing upon broader messages about the law of lawmaking how we find within particular contexts lawmaking, ways of making law, uh, which somehow uh, answer to different substantive values like democracy and equality. Uh, last, my last uh, slide. Good, I didn't. I may not get. This is on agency, and again, I, I would say, I've done some work recently on the relationship between global law and global justice. Uh, uh, which uh, I don't necessarily want to share with you, partly because I'm not very happy with it yet, partly because I don't have time. But uh, in all of this, I think it's interesting because a lot of people who talk about global law don't talk about global justice. It's interesting, you know, that there's a whole literature on global justice out there in political theory and international relations, uh, which uh, often neglects global law. But global law literature often neglects global justice literature as well. It's as if the two fields are in kind of negative thrall to each other. We will neglect you and you neglect us. And, uh, uh, and, 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 the, and of course, at some level, it makes sense because if you put to one side what I said in the last slide, which is about trying to find some kind of new version of an inner normativity of law, which is normatively consequential, I think, whether or not you agree with what I'm doing, I think the enterprise of trying to do that isn't meaningless. Uh, but it's a very different thing from that to looking at the broader question of what can law do to promote global justice, however we define what global justice is, right? And there's all sorts of ways of looking at that connection, but one of the places we have to start is with the attitude of what I call the Judas generative sources. I've already argued that these Judas generative sources are very, very important in a context of global law. And what I'm saying here, and it's developed very much in the last section of, of my book, is that you know there 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 are there are there are a set of forms of deformation professionnel or whatever you know which you find within the legal profession and within other sorts of uh, those associated with legal profession, uh, which uh, aren't necessarily helpful uh, to thinking about the relationship between global law and global justice in a productive or progressive way. There's a kind of institutional pragmatism professional myopia, a compartmentalism, a kind of embedded legalism, 
So a lot of the areas we're talking about, in their very particularity, uh, in their very particularity, reinforce that sort of sense of myopia that a lot of people engaged in large issues of, uh, 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 of, of global law encounter a fragmented reality. And this relates to Maria's point about the lack of society. Not the same point, but it relates to it, the way in which global law often emerges in very, very particular contexts and is reinforced by an already professional orientation towards what I call embedded legalism, compartmentalism. But alongside that, you have other sorts of attitudes which aren't necessarily helpful either. You have a kind of Judocentric or unanchored idealism. You know, there are certain people, there are certain people within the field of global law uh, uh, who basically see in the development, in the breaking of the state-based principle, something which allows, you know, for the, it becomes, it's almost like a kind of new Jerusalem you know, of global law. We now have these abstract principles, especially within the area of the abstract normative ideas. The suggestion that somehow the law, the world can be made through law, and the law somehow, as if the law isn't, as if the world isn't already made by all sorts of other forces, and that, uh, and that good people with good ideas are those who can actually help remake the world through law. There is a kind of unanchored idealism associated with that. Against that, there's a whole radical critique, a whole CLS movement across various continents, which often tends towards a kind of structural fatalism and disillusionment, which looks at the same picture and sees the opposite, which sees law as complicit in many of the problems of global injustice, and which you know, sees global law as just adding to or multiplying that complicity. Now, I'm saying that we don't have to give in to any of these, not to institutional pragmatism, not to unanchored idealism, not to structural fatalism. If we do give in to any of these, then you know the, the agency of lawyers involved in thinking about global law will not be will not be developed to good effect. Okay, thank you.